Welcome to FACT's webinar called Pasture Management for Limited Resource Farmers. Our presenter today is Felicia Bell with NCAT and ATRA, and this webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating this session today. So thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you. So let me just take a moment or two to give a, a few quick introductions in case um, you're new to FACT. Um, so Food Animal Concerns Trust are FACT. We are a small nonprofit organization. We are based out of Illinois, but we do work nationally. Uh, we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a, a healthy and humane manner. And to accomplish this, we, uh, we work by supporting humane farmers such as yourselves, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and also by helping consumers make informed food choices. So I have the honor and pleasure of directing FACT's Humane Farming Program, um, which works directly with farmers uh, from across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, uh, mentorship program, personalized uh, promotional materials, and of course, webinars on a variety of topics. So I do invite you to visit our website to learn all about all of our services. So at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our fabulous guest presenter, Felicia Bell. Felicia is an agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, and she's based out of NCAT's Gulf States office, which is located in Jackson, Mississippi. So we're super, super duper lucky to have Felicia with us today to kick off the year in our webinar series for the winter. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor and the <laughs> controls over to her so that she may begin her presentation. So take it away, Felicia. Thank you so much for having me today, Larissa. I appreciate it so much. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm just going to give a brief uh, backstory of myself. I am a farmer here in Mississippi, central Mississippi, and I always kind of ca categorize myself as born into it. So literally, I was born into agriculture, traditional agriculture, chemical free, um, and that's all I know. And so I'm honored in, to be an ag specialist with NCAT um, because it basically just have started from, from birth have grown up in it, learned it from my grandfather, um, and just have taken it into various ways throughout the years. And so I'm just very honored to be here. And I'm going to um, not show my video while I'm presenting, and then I'll come back for our Q&A. So today our topic is pasture management for limited resource farmers. Again, I am Felicia Bell, Ag Specialist for NCAT Gulf States Regional Office. So what our topic focus today will be um, on the lack of knowledge and lack of training of small limited resource farmers on proper management styles for their particular farm. We will discuss that these management decisions not only affect their farm, but their community as well as the earth's sustainability for years to come. Long ago, livestock traditions. So most farmers um, that has any age on them at all are just so familiar with the open continuous grazing, utilizing silvopasture. And as we know, statistically, most of our farmers are up in age. And I think that number used to be 65, and it may have even risen since then, but we know we're dealing with older farmers and the mindset of the farmer is to continue to do what I know because it hasn't been broken. It's still working for them to a certain degree. And so farmers were taught this, that utilize open continuous grazing because their land was pristine. Many, many years ago, they had great stands on their land and that's what they're so used to having. The grass growth was phenomenal with so many varieties. So cattle and small ruminants got their nutrients and then that strictly came from the land 
and then their water, which they were utilizing ponds at that time, and of course, our mineral blocks. But now we move, as the years have progressed, we're moving into that lack of education for our farmers. So most livestock methods and practices are taught privately with astronomical fees for a small producer. And so most of these classes are not local, so travel is a must. And that, you know, that brings up um, some issues for some of our farmers, especially our limited resource farmers. Some of the land grant institutions have not started their research on some of these methods and so even though these practices were utilized at the inception of land grant institutions, and what I mean by that, the practices that, that we hear of today were done by many cultures for millennia. So they, they've been around, but we just haven't really tapped into them that we can share it widespread among ourselves. And so some of our ag professionals have not had enough experience with these methods to share the benefits. And then lastly, of course, if they know this information, they feel like the farmer still not, cannot rather afford the upfront cost of starting these methodologies. So sometimes they don't even share because they, they don't want to bring a burden on that farmer financially. And so we understand that but at the end of the day, we still want all our farmers to learn these methods. So the lack of understanding of benefits, these are some of the questions I have gotten over the years. Why should I plant pasture mixes and spend that money if I have Bahia and Bermuda grasses? And of course I'm in the South, so these are our grasses here. What's the importance of paddocks and the funds to put up more fencing? What is the purpose of silvopasture in my pasture management? Why do I have, have to move my animals so often? Do I have to limit the use of my pond for watering and put troughs throughout? And then lastly, I was told that I have to take my animals off the land if I see. So these are questions that always come up when we're trying to share with farmers these new or, or, or older methodologies that we need to bring back into place to make sure we're protecting our earth. Creating more markets is one thing that I notice within the limited resource community is we have to make sure we have those markets, but also making sure that we are not telling the farmer what market we want them in. So, the mentality of markets is one size fits all. And all of us know that's not true. Each farmer, each land, each state has all different type of things that's going on. So it's not one size fits all. But we tend to do that as ag professionals. We're training. Of course, we want it easier uh, for ourselves a lot of times. And we tend to just say these things to the masses and not necessarily work individually with our farmers. So most farmers sell at their local sale barn as if they are getting the same prices and the benefits from 30 years ago. And as all of us know, that has changed. That has really, really changed. Most farmers do not have transportation to haul their animals to and fro. So of course that brings up a, a conflict and, 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 and crisis for a lot of our farmers. Most farmers are not physically fit to work or handle their own animals. So the key is to create your own markets from the need of your community. So again, the farmer is creating it. So an example, a farmer could create a local meat market. And these, again, let me give that disclaimer, these first two are things, of course, that you will have to have a budget and, you know, be able to create it because it will bring in, it has to bring in financial resources to create it. And so, yes, creating a local meat market, it may be a need of the community, but it's going to ask a lot of that farmer and that farm family. Next, a farmer could open a local cafe featuring their products as well as other local products. Again, needing the finances to start that. 
Then your farmer's market. Most of us are do a farmer's market or even a farm stand on our land. But again, we don't want to tell the farmer what market they need to be in, but we want to share them alternatives and ideas that they may not have thought of. Business versus homestead. Most farmers provide for their family, even extending family and community for generations. That, that goes on to this day. Grandparents uh, feeding grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So the knowledge of, of now creating a business out of a necessity is somewhat far-fetched. That Our farmer are not really understanding that. And then when you have some ag professionals asking farmers to relinquish their homestead activities, like they are asking them to stop homesteading to become a commercial farmer. My opinion, that is a no-no because all they know, and we're talking about our senior experienced farmers, not new and beginning, more the limited resource farmers that's been doing this 30, 40, 50 years, you cannot ask them to stop doing something and pick up something else. So we got to learn the key is to work with farmers where they are in knowledge, resources, and land. So always be up from what they have and what they own. So it becomes easier to educate a farmer if you are working with his or her desires versus changing his narrative. Now, solutions. To be good stewards of the land, all farmers have to be good stewards via education and implementation. We have to listen to our farmers, offer solutions that's conducive for the resources they have, and then invitation to local groups and seminars. Some of us have vast networks, but we cannot forget the farmers that don't have those networks. We wanna invite them to local groups that of course now are online, so it's easier for them. They don't have to spend money to travel uh, to a, a adjacent state or cross country. So keep that in mind, invite local farmers to different networks you have and different organizations you're part of where they can now get that education. Share our knowledge with our neighbor. We don't wanna keep it to ourselves. And then more peer-to-peer -peer training for ag professionals. Implement these practices. When we introduce things to farmers, we want them to start implementing it. Now, I always suggest not on a large scale because it may or may not work. So we don't want them to take 50 acres and then go out and put something on it. I'm just a farm believer, in, especially with a limited resource farmer, do a small scale. So may do half an acre, quarter acre to test out some cover crops, test out some perennial grass mixes. Whatever you're bringing new to your farm, do not try to do a large scale because now that is impeding in your pocketbook at a larger scale when if you do a quarter acre or even smaller, it, it don't hurt as bad when it don't work. But farming is always, um, we're always experimenting. We always, is something new. And so we have to be realistic that we're going to have failures. Everything is not going to work when we do it on our farm. And lastly, I always push research, research, research. As ag professionals, we're here to assist you. But we also, because we talk to so many people from so many different areas, you have to do the research yourself for your particular region and state. So as Larissa stated, we had many questions from you and I thank you so much. That made my, my life easier because I love answering questions um, to the best of my ability. And if we cannot answer them today, we have a vast uh, 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 amount of ag specialists within NCAT that can definitely get it answered for you. So our first question was, I would like to learn about options for marketing pastured meat products if USDA slaughterhouses are not accessible in my region. And again, these are my answers and these are not the end all be all answers. 
Um, so state inspected slaughterhouses for in-state sales only, and that's state specific. Again, we stated I'm in Mississippi, so we have both. We have our USDA inspected and we have our Mississippi state inspected. And for our particular state, Mississippi state inspected slaughterhouses, we would only be able to sell that meat within our state. And you would have to find out from your state Department of Agriculture, one, do you have those type uh, facilities available and what are the rules for them uh, to share your product? Next, selling your animals as breeding stock. So many people now are getting into farming. And so you may be, may be that key person in your area that have high quality animals that you could sell. Travel to a USDA inspected slaughterhouse, but with the added cost, see if they can sell your meat under their label. That some of our slaughterhouses, those custom slaughterhouses do that. They have their own brands, they have their own labels. And so that helps you because you already know it's sold. When you take it there, you know it's sold. So that's a good thing. So please check that out. We do have those here in Mississippi as well. And that has been, you know, a, 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 a just a plus for so many farmers. Farm online sales page of animals. Create a value added product and or meat market in your area. And lastly, build your own slaughterhouses. We have had farmers that had to just break down and do that for themselves because they were raising a lot of animals. They were not just one breed of animal. They were doing many animals and they needed that assistance and it wasn't one close to them. And these are the examples of what I was stating. This is on the left is like an example of a farm online and sometimes these be farm cooperatives and sometimes they actually be sale barns that are help farmers in the area to put up pictures and sometimes they even send out like the sale barn to send out photographers to help the farmers and so this is something that you can see but as i was researching it's so many of these that are done just a farmer they don't necessarily have to be a farm cooperative or a sale barn in your area. You could create a, 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 a more so like a, a poster like this for your own farm. And then uh, to the right, of course, is this labeled meat. And that could be done from your local custom slaughterhouse or even yourself, breaking your animal down into cuts of meat and then selling it with your own brand. Next question. Regenerative pasture management on limited land incorporating different species. So many farmers are very successful at this endeavor. Of course, farm management is the key. And then stocking density is a big factor. You know, soil health is always crucial. I have really changed my tune over the years. Soil health is what we are trying to move towards if we're not already there. And some of us are. Uh, because we've been farming so long, but we're really soil farmers, not necessarily a chicken farmer, a poultry farmer, or a sheep farmer. We're soil farmers because if that's not right, nothing will be right for us. And so that is very crucial as well when we move into these different pasture managements. All third party contractors need to be in place. So again, remember I said, some of our farmers don't have transportation. They don't have trucks and trailers. You need to have lined up that person, um, you know, contractually already. They have to have their dates in advance. So, you know, you cannot call this uh, transporter a week in advance. We're talking about months in advance where you know my animals will be ready on this date. And also harvesting, having your custom slaughterhouse ready for you. Um, and so forth. So these are the types of things you have to work on when it's limited land and then you're incorporating all of these different species. And then on farm harvesting, again, I said some people do the uh, on farm slaughterhouses. You could do your poultry. Uh, so it, for it's chicken harvesting on your land in certain states, that's legal to do. And then you also can move into doing mobile units. Some of our areas around the country, uh, some of our extension agencies and even um, 
private entities have mobile units that they travel around to different farms, but you know labor will be needed that day. So you have to line that up in advance as well. And then lastly, marketing and sales is a must. You got to let people know that, th that you're harvesting that day. So these are the types of things when you have limited land, but you have a lot of animals and a lot of harvesting to do, you have to make sure, certain that these things are in place. Savory Institute, I'm, I'm just such a fun, fun fan and, and just, I love Alan Savory. I've had a, a many, several times of meeting him and, and sitting at his feet. And so Savory Institute, this is just a picture of sharing before and after when we move into regenerative agriculture. What does it look like? And so we see before is annual monoculture, manipulation of parts, command and control. We think we're controlling nature and that's not true. And so that's a reductionist attitude. And so when we look, we work with nature, not against nature. So we're going to be working with perennials and polyculture, management of the whole, and then facilitating. And so that's a holistic way of looking at rebuilding our land, rebuilding our soil uh, for our animals and, and, and for generations to come. Next question, suggestions for how to start rotational grazing, especially with small ruminants on limited acreage. So first and foremost, research your land, your climate, and breed of animal first. And when I say climate, each one of us have microclimate. And so you have to know what can be grown on your land. So you may have a farmer that's a, a mile down the road, and they could grow certain things, but you cannot. And so that's because of microclimate. So really studying where you are. And most of us just haven't even thought of that. And so please do that first. Then you have to do the research on how to maintain this breed of animal, uh, your nutrients. I always say and was taught by my grandfather that you do all of this research before you buy one animal. You want to be able because you're putting this animal behind a fence. They cannot do for themselves anymore once you fence them in. And so they know what to eat, how to eat, and they will move uh, through our land, you know, our land and throughout the country on their own merits because they know how to. And so when we put them behind fences, we need to make sure we know what we're doing. And so what is the nutrient requirement of the particular breed you have on your land? So if it's cattle, what do they need? Sheep, goat, whatever it is, make sure you know. Start growing those forages that answers the, the last question. Start growing those particular forages that's going to be conducive for the nutrient requirement for your animal, for your breed. Once the forage is established, purchase your first stock of animals. And I would say five to 10 animals if you are a person that don't have experience raising animals. The ones of us been doing it our whole life, we can, you know, get a lot of animals at one time. But new and beginning farmers, limited resource farmers, when you don't have a lot of financial resources, start small, start small. And you will be so surprised. You will have a lot of animals very quickly because animals will breed. And so don't worry about I don't have a lot yet. It will come. But you have to learn how to work these animals first. Utilize temporary fencing for your cross fencing to move them from paddock to paddock, learning the various benefit of forages you have planted on their body. So you want to see, are they gaining weight? Are they gaining the weight in the right areas? You want to see their body condition, but you have to observe those animals. And so observe, observe, observe. You have to do that when you are a farmer, period, regardless of livestock or vegetables. And then you change as needed. You refocus and then you have to be financially stable to pivot. Uh, definitely with what have gone on this past year, all of us had to pivot. And so but you have to have those financial, uh, you know, you have to be financially stable and being really liquid to be able to pivot uh, in, when you need to. And so this is just a, a picture showing the patterns and how because we had several questions on how do you rotate? 
And this is just one of those ways. And of course, there's many, many ways that you can set up your rotational grazing system um, because it's based upon your land. And so, you know, numbering your paddocks, uh, getting your overhead view from uh, your farm service agency, even possibly NRCS. Most of the time, both of those entities have an overhead view of your land if you have been working with them and been farming uh, for a while. Next, we have another picture that shows a different uh, way of setting up your paddock. You have an alley for easy access to all your paddocks in the center. Possible portable fencing for internal fencing can be moved as required. And then each paddock is being grazed for three days. So they're kind of moving them um, to make sure. And of course, the little blue dot type things, those are your waters. And so these are the types of things you can start looking at to give you an idea of how you need to set up your land. Again, we got questions on fencing. Um, of course, as many fences out there uh, for your temporary fencing. Of course, most of us know about perimeter fencing and so forth, but this is somewhat uh, some of the fencing that some of us use for is our electrified netting. Um, and that's being used by many farmers across the country for sheep, for chickens, many, many different types, even rabbits I have seen um, when they just letting the rabbits run free. They're not necessarily caged up. They do have um, uh, houses for them to go in at night as, as well as most of you know the chickens as well. So just wanted to show you that, the temporary fence and using electrified netting. And then we had a question on how to afford our fence. So two ways to afford, well, really three, but, but a, a way of affording your fence based upon your need, utilizing NRCS. So Natural Resources Conservation Service, of course, is a USDA entity. Most of them do have offices in your either county or next over. They're usually close to you. And you can... Um, go in and apply for perimeter fencing as well as cross fencing. And I stated here that that is state specific. All of the NRCS state offices do not do cross fencing. And so you have to make sure you check with your state office and or your local um, county office to see what is offered for you when it comes to fencing. And last, of course, is purchasing it on your own. We had a question just asking um, about this. So we really wanted to state that, yes, NRCS could definitely assist you with that. If you have a specific type of fence different than the requirement of NRCS, you would have to purchase that fence. And then possibly, depending on your state rules, they you would get that cost, cost share for installation. But again, you can, don't hold me to that. Each state is different. So you please, please, please have to check with your state office and the requirements and or your local NRCS office. Our next question was, I'm pastoring chickens and would like to hear about methodology for that but I also plan to incorporate ruminants down the road and would love insights on any best practices as I transition to a mixed flock or herd. So we do, ATRA has a publication on multi-species grazing. That would definitely help a lot of you moving into the mixed flock or mixed herd because uh, most of us do start with chickens and sometimes we small, start out with small ruminants and then add poultry. Uh, but multi-species grazing is a good publication to read to kind of get you started on that. Of course, we have a lot of farmers across the country that utilize chicken tractors on, on built various ways with multi-species grazing. Then, of course, we have our free range operation. Um, you know, they're, they're only going into the houses at night uh, for the fear of predators, but they free range all day. Then you have on-farm chicken processing, like we stated earlier, and that's state-specific. You have to find out from your state Department of Agriculture if it's allowable. 
breeding stock sales from the farm, as we stated. And then lastly, USDA or state inspected slaughterhouses. And we had a question about invasive species and pastures and multi-species grazing really, really assists with that. Um, Because most of the things that we call weeds and call invasive species, a lot of the different um, animals, different breeds can really eat that. Um, some of them are herbs. And so, but the animals know what they can eat, what they can and and so forth. So it, it, it's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I know the question was even with thistle and, and it is cattle that have eaten thistle. And so, it, you know, it's okay. Just let them be. And then again, it's observing the animals, see what they will do and so forth. Uh, that's not going to be all animals that would do that, but some animals will eat those invasive species that you think, oh, I got, I have to do the work uh, to to um, take that out or or just you know move that away from my land. One farm that I that I have visited many many times is White Oak Pastures uh, with Mr. Will Harris and in Bluffton, Georgia. This is just an example of that multi-species grazing. Um, these are pictures from their land, the overhead shot, as well as one down close to the ground. Um, and I would just ask you all, if, if you have time in the near future, visit them uh, because they, they, their story is phenomenal. Um, so please, you know, I wanted to show this is large scale, of course. So this is not, this is not a small farm. But I definitely wanted you to get the gist of that multi-species grazing. And this is one of their pictures with their turkeys, um, as, as well as with the cattle roaming there as well. So they have various ways that they multi-species because they, they have a lot there. Uh, it is, uh, as you saw, the sheep there. They do chickens um, as well. So And then also um, uh, pasture pork. So it's a lot that they have there on the land that they do multi-species grazing. Next question is suggestion on grasses that grow well with limited rainfall. So in some of our states, they have irrigated pastures and NRCS uh, um, has that as a call share. So again, stay specific, but check with your uh, NRCS office and see do they uh, do that for as irrigated pastures with their um, call share program. Then research, what can grow in your area that is conducive for high nutrients for your breed of animal? And we talked about that earlier. And then implement some of these grass varieties on a small area to see if it matures. Observe and incorporate, and then seasonally test and implement. Um, and seasonally meaning um, what can be grown each season. Just, just do that each time and then see, is it conducive? This is one of our publications, Atra again, uh, with irrigated pastures, and we do have um, a few of them on irrigated pastures. Um, one of our ag specialists just, just retired, uh, has a awesome uh, farm that utilizes irrigated pastures, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful sight to see uh, how that growth, that stand is there uh, for, uh, their animals. It's just a beautiful sight to see, but, uh, they, but they are utilizing irrigated pastures. Um, but again, and this is in the state of Montana. And so that particular state office do, uh, call share with irrigated pastures. And then we have a next question. We need inexpensive system to map and record use of temporary paddocks. So Atra, again, has a grazing planning manual and workbook. And then I also was able to find this using the grazing records spreadsheet for documentation and planning. And so um, I definitely would give this to Larissa, this particular uh, link, uh, so you can have access to that. And then I, I always, I'm a firm believer before we buy something um, and, and move into that, Try utilizing doing an Excel system ourselves just to learn how to do because some of these planning record keeping type things are very, very complicated to learn. And so it's kind of like you utilize Excel, get 
your feet wet with that, learn how to do it very, very well, and then, you know, start moving into more advanced type systems um, and so forth. But we know we have a lot of farmers out there know how to do that and they can jump right into a lot of these various programs. Uh, but Excel have worked for many, many of us starting new and beginning and starting on limited resource. Excel systems have really, really worked. But the key is really getting that overhead view of your farm and drawing on that that picture, uh, that printout of how you want your paddocks to be set up. That's first and foremost. Best way to improve pasture while still having to use them. So you can implement your selected forage on designated areas. Um, and I have a picture of that coming up, but you can um, it, it, definitely, if you already have your temporary fencing or cross fencing up, you can implement and start seeding those particular paddocks with various forage slash cover crops. Um, because yes, our animals can, you can twofold or sometimes threefold your cover crop uh, for your am animals versus them going in and eating the cover crop versus a uh, chemical kill or discing it in. You can implement selective forest seasoning like we spoke of earlier. So you, you can just test out various varieties of uh, seasonally to see if you can do that while the animals are still on the land. Then most farmers, especially large acreage farmers, they do a full pasture implementation. And so they're disking and seeding. They do everything. But a lot of times they have other land. And so they'll say, OK, we're going to do this 50 acres this year, but they may have another 50 acres down the road or in another county that they could put the animals on. Then selection to assist in long-term stands is your perennial pasture mixes and native grasses. I, I have done that here and I would, you know, would ask farmers to research that, to do both, seed both. Your perennial pasture mixes, of course, is going to come up first and your native grass, it takes, you know, two to a lot of times, three years really to really set and, and where you can really have a stand and it's coming up and conducive for the animals to utilize and so forth. But check on that and see if that's conducive for your land. These are examples of um, the designated areas of growing uh, certain crops, certain legumes, certain cover crop, whatever you're trying to do, perennial uh, pasture mixes. This is designated because you can see in the picture the difference in the look of the the, the um, paddock on the right of the cattle. And so these are warm season legumes. And then to the red, right, you have orchard grass. And so think about, again, doing perennial pasture mixes with your native grasses, seeding it all together. Interested in planting proper food for pasture grazing poultry. So again, researching for your particular breed, what is the nutrient requirement for your particular poultry, um, you know, what you're growing, uh, raising rather, and then planting the proper forage for them. While establishing, implement nutritional dense grains um, to make sure they're getting what they need. And so barley, millet, burger wheat, um, buckwheat. Um, I know I have planted millet here for our uh, poultry. And so it's just what is conducive for your area and the climate, the temperature and so forth, but really get the, the quality grains um, that really, really can keep the energy up of your animal uh, and give them their uh, trace minerals. That's what all of us need. Animals need it. We need it. Uh, because our bodies will start failing if we don't get our trace minerals. So that's why I say implement really that nutritional dense grains, not just uh, fillers. And this is an example of a farm uh, that have chickens that, that are pasture uh, fed and grazing. And this is Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and white clover. So that farmer chose these varieties. And so again, it's your choice, but I just wanted to one, show you a picture of this, these types of, of grasses and so forth, uh, but it definitely can be done.
Frost seeding are other ways to reseed organic pastures without tillage or availability of a no-till planter. So again, that's hand seeding. And I know that that can be very, very hard for large acres farmers, you know, 20 acres, 10 acres. That's that's a lot. But if you don't have access to equipment, then we have to move to other things. Um, so, of course, hand seeding. Deer feeders on a four wheeler. Uh, one farmer in Texas, I heard her state that she did the hand seeding on a golf cart. So she was riding, you know, driving on a golf cart, and 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 it was kind of funny because she had to do it by herself. So she's driving herself and seating at the same time. So it was, she was like, oh, it was just so difficult for her. But then a farmer came along, and again, that said helping one another that said, hey, we can mount a deer feeder on a four-wheeler, and then that's what she used from that. So this, of course, most of us know the different uh hand seeders or push seeders that we can utilize for our land. And then also our deer feet are mounted on the four wheeler. That would make it so much easier. Uh, and again, if we don't have it, that's why we have to have farmer friends and network where we could possibly hire a friend, a neighbor, a, a brother to come and do this type of work for us because they have the four wheeler, they have the deer feeder. And so keep that in mind where you don't take on all of that for yourself. Uh, again, we want to watch our budgets and how much we're putting into that. Um, we had a question about recommended stocking rate for different livestock. This is small, but I do have a copy of this. And I sent Larissa, I have been following Sarah Flack for years. And this is a worksheet that she put out, oh my goodness, probably 10 plus years ago. I've, I've been using because I can't even find it online anymore. So it's very, very old, but it works. I, I really have um, I had various workshops helping farmers to utilize this sheet because it, it helps you point blank for your land, for your uh, dry matter, how much you know uh, grass stand, how tall your grass stand. So it, it just works for you. It's conducive for you and not anyone else. And that's why I like this particular worksheet. So we had questions about this how, amount of pasture required per ruminant. Uh, well, the question was amount of pasture required for dairy sheep. And I just wanted to put in there is usually three to three and a half percent per body weight. Uh, and so you're you're with the example I'm utilizing is dairy sheep. And so you could just see here how much dry matter that dairy sheep would need per day based upon their weight. Now, I always have to tell you, if the animal is pregnant, and most of our farmers will forget this, that percentage goes up because you know they're going to need more dry matter when they're pregnant. And so, you know, don't always stick to this number. You need to increase it. They will eat more uh, when they're pregnant. And so that number will vary based upon uh, your animal uh, throughout the year. Uh, this same question has swath grazing um, and just wanted to give, give a, a, a definition of that, the management practice that can be used to extend the grazing season and to reduce feed, labor, and manure handling costs for cattle producers. And it's been done in Western Canada. And that's, that was their question. Could it be done in the Midwest? And so I would say yes, but again, we have to do it to see if it worked first. Me saying, and I live in the South and we don't get cold. We had snow yesterday, but that's rare for us. And so me saying that living in the South is not helping a farmer in the Midwest. So you definitely would have to try it. I witnessed it in Kentucky. So they did do the swath grazing in Kentucky. And a lot of, you know, a lot of things online said North Kentucky is the Midwest and South Kentucky is the South. But still, I, I always would say do it. See on a, you know, on a smaller scale, see what your animals kind of pivot to doing swath grazing. And then our summary, pasture management is not a one size fit all. You have to research, you then implement, and of course you observe. 
So you have to utilize assistance of ag professionals in your area. We want you to do that. Um, it's so many of us out here and we're here to serve. We're here to help. Then you also have your seasoned and experienced farmer. Please get them as a mentor. They have done it for many years and they know the tricks of the trade. Things that you won't find in a book, find in a newsletter or a blog, they know it. It's, it hasn't even been written down. <laughs> and so please utilize those types of farmers. Record keeping is the key. All the things I just went over, you got to keep good records. You want to know if, it, if what you implemented failed this year. And then if it did, how did you tweak it? You have to notate that. So you won't repeat that same issue 10 years from now or your farm manager or your children or grandchildren. You don't want to repeat the, the issue and then readjust as needed. We always have to readjust. The farmers know we have to do that, but we have to be ready uh, to readjust and pivot when needed. This is my contact information. Um, what You're welcome to reach out to me. And as I stated, we had so many questions. I was not able to do all of them, but please, please reach out to me. And if I cannot answer, I definitely will get another ag specialist on board to assist you. Uh, and please check out our website at atra.ncat.org. That is where all of our publications are housed. And in Cat Atra, we have over 400 publications and um, we have videos and blogs and podcasts. So there's a wealth of information on our site. So please just visit us there and uh, reach out. I will tell you, all of us are working remotely. So when you call our office number, please, please let it ring because it just gives a, a little time to so it can forward to our personal phones. Um, we've been having an issue with that and we just really want to give that notation uh, to everyone that we are here for you, uh, but please just stay on the line longer uh, so it can reach us and we can take your call. And at this time, I'll stop sharing and go to Larissa. Hey, hi everyone. Well, oh, that's a big picture of me. Hold on one sec. Let me, we do have a couple minutes here. I know there's been so much really good interaction um, in the chat bar. So it's wonderful to see everyone kind of helping and you know answering other people's questions. There's been some really good um, observations and uh, recommendations as well. You know, I think the idea of finding a map that's, you know, through your conservation district or through um, another way that uh, was brought up is wonderful. And, you know, having that dry erase uh, marker at your disposal is, um, you know, a nice way of doing it. Um, let's see, I'm trying to look. There's been a lot of discussion about fencing. Let's see. Um, there was a question. Let's see. Um, Felicia, about how to stop wild birds from eating all the seeds after hand seeding. Do you have any um, <laughs> insight on that? Yes, yes, yes. I, oh my goodness, I go through this all the time. So I, it's several gurus that I follow and, and, and those are things I share with Larissa, but one of them share seeding, but then putting hay on top. So one, you don't let your seeds kind of wash away. That's one reason for doing it. And then others, the grass seeds are covered. So the birds really don't see the grass seeds. And, but then of course, that, like I said, the hay is that mat to let it really start germinating and growing and start really setting the seed. And so uh, I have used, utilized that uh, even recently, but yes, that is an issue. Um, especially if you not, you're not utilizing a no-till drill. You're going to have that if you're broadcasting. And so other things that I've used over the years is I have left my animals on the land. And the reason for it is to let them push it in the ground. So that, that was kind of my trick of the trade that, that I really over the years haven't had the issue of a lot of birds. Some of them will come out there, but the animals just, they will trample it in because it's seasonal and it's not going to come up right then. 
And so I would let my sheep just trample it in and that would help to at least get soil seed contact. Excellent. I want to mention that um, well, there was a question about the Sarah Flack work sh worksheet. And um, do we have a, I mean, I know it's going to be in your presentation um, slide. Do we have like a, a Word document of that or is that more just a, a, a no, you do? I, I'm sending it to you. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. So it's it coming. wasn't in the links I sent at first, but as you saw, I, I kept adding links. And so mm -hmm. I'll get that to you so you can send it out to everyone. And I'll also mention that last, um, yeah, last spring, so March 2020, FACT did host a webinar series with Sarah. So I'll send around those um, recordings as well because she is she is a wonderful resource and just it just makes everything so much easier to <laughs> understand yeah. coming from her. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, anything else in the chat bar that man, I feel like people have been um, figuring it out themselves is great. You know, the op finding a mentor, using Google Earth, um, lots of information about the, all the different fencing um, people's experiences. It's just so good to hear. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see. I'm not sure if there's anything else that we're missing. Did you see anything, um, Felicia? Let me see. Let me know. <laughs> And I appreciate everyone about the fencing because, yeah, it's so many fences out there. And I was trying to find for everyone. It is a company. And I, oh, I just cannot think of the name. And I tried, tried, tried and, and was trying to look up their information. I know I have it. But it is the um, galvanized like hog wire. It's hog wire and it has the knots to hold it together. And but you can electrify it and see most of our fences, we have to put the, the plastic buffers on to electrify. But this they, they made this fence to be able to connect directly to the fence and electrify it. And so I was like, oh, I need to get this to everyone. So I'm going to keep researching. And so, Larissa, I may send it to you even later. But uh, I know it would be just awesome for farmers to have that where you don't have to buy all this extra stuff that you could just roll this fence out and put it up like a hog wire. But then you can, you know, can hook up straight uh, to the to, to electrify it. That, that yeah, send me whatever you are able to uncover and I'll pass it along. Um, so what, I'll take one more question here and then we'll. I'll wrap it up with just some, um, inf you know, information about what's coming up next. But um, Paige is wondering about your experience with tree fodder. Any anything that you'd like oh, to? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I want to move into that. I haven't done it as of yet. I'm familiar with it, of course, because um, I work with farmers in Africa as well. And I that's where I learned it and picked it up and started researching it. It's utilized in other countries a lot. And so I, I would say yes to that. Again, it's just researching to see what trees are conducive for your area and if they really would mature enough to have enough fodder for your animals. That's the key for us is, is making sure it can mature here because uh, most of us get cold. And a lot of these trees are in, uh, you know, tropical or very you know, arid climate. So they, they grow year round and, and never are brought, brought up against any cold whatsoever. So please, please do your research, you know, before you buy a lot of them and so forth and have them shipped in. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let me just ha do a little bit of housekeeping before we, we sign off. Um, friendly reminder that there is going to be that, that quick survey that pops up on everyone's screen. I'll also send a link to it. It's very, very short. Um, if you can take a minute to, to, to fill that out, it's really helpful to, for both me and for, um, for presenters and future presenters to have that information. Um, like I said, a recording of this webinar and a list of links and uh, the slides will be coming your way probably tomorrow morning. So keep an eye out for that. Um, a quick plug for some other webinars we have coming up this winter. Super excited. Next week, we're going to welcome um, Felicia's colleague at NCAT, uh, Kara Kroger. She's going to be with us to talk about how um, 
pasture biodiversity benefits animal health, um, among other things. And then the following week, we're going to have Linda Coffey. Um, she's Linda's wonderful. She did a three-part series about ruminants uh, managing parasites with small ruminants, and she's going to be with us later this month to discuss grazing tips to avoid trouble. So some really good sessions coming up, and I'll send links to those registration forms as well. So I think um, we're just about out of time. I just want to give a very sincere thank you to you, Felicia, for spending the hour with us and, um, you know, just making this really uh, personalized and, you know, um, engaging with us. And um, I really, really appreciate it. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have you. And um, maybe we'll have some future webinar sessions together. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to everyone out in the audience for your interest and your time and sticking around um, and being, you know, so careful with your animals and for, for sustainability in all different forms. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. We couldn't do it without you. Um, and so thank you. We're really glad you could be here. Hope to connect soon and um, we will be in touch. So have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.